Right, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, tonight we're going to try and discuss wind shear, um, thermal wave, and then depending how the how the evening goes, uh, we might discuss whether you should turn into wind or downwind uh, when you're looking for a thermal. So, um, but yeah, we. We want to try and have a few questions as well because it it helps to know if, if we're reaching the spot and if it's not too complicated or not too simple and and also sometimes the questions also help me prompt um, for for some other things that I might have forgotten to to add or or to try and answer some important questions. So. Um, I think what we'll start with is uh, the thermal wave. So what I'm going to start with is a day here in the Nationals, uh, the South African Nationals. Um, in 1999. Let's hang on. No, this is not what we want. Okay. Um, this was uh, the 5th, 15th of December, um, nine, um, 2019, sorry. And um, so two years ago, um, and I'm actually gonna go back and I'm gonna just show you what so I'm going to look, I actually managed to find the sounding for this day. So let me just find that. Okay, so, so what I've got here is the sounding. Um, it's quite handy what you can do on NOAA. You can go back, there's a full archive. Um, of every day. So if you can remember a special day's gliding that you had, uh, you can go back and, and, and have a look at it retrospectively, which is quite handy. Um, so on this day, the 15th of December, 2019, at briefing, um, the weatherman, I forget who it was, it might've been Marcus or Sven, um, puts this uh, T-Fi up and I, um, Apart from storms and so on, the, the, the one key thing that I, I pay a lot of attention to, uh, especially in competitions, is, is essentially this, uh, the wind rows, which shows the strength and direction uh, with altitude. So on this day, you could see that we had about 20 knots or just over 20 knots um, from the northwest. Um, which quickly came up to about 25 to 30 knots um, from the north northwest at a height of 800 millibars, which I would guess 700 millibars is, is 10,000 feet. So that, this is a height of about 8,000 feet or 9,000 feet. And you can see by the sounding that there's a pretty decent or there's a very decent inversion. Uh, convection's not very deep, uh, eight, nine, say 9,000 feet, this is in Valcom. Um, so if it's a 9,000 foot day, Valcom's about four and a half thousand feet. We're talking about a, a four and a half thousand foot above ground level thermals, which were, which were basically blue. Um, if, and if I remember correctly, the day was blue. Uh, this, this is also telling me that it's going to be blue. Um, if I lift the, the dew point here uh, along these along these little lines here, um, the lifted dew point, it it kind of gets gets close. I mean, if you had a really 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 hot spot, there's a potential for cloud. But I remember on this day there was no clouds, um, so a very strong inversion. Um, to break the inversion, we would have had to have had. You take the, kind of this corner here and then you bring it down 
you would have needed to have something in excess of, of 35, you know, 36, 37 degrees on a day when it was 20 degrees. So there was, there was no chance that, that anything was going to over, overdevelop. So when I see this, I immediately think there's a good chance for shear wave, or I need to be on the lookout for shear wave because the requirements are met. The first requirement being a decent inversion. And the second requirement is that there's a wind change with altitude um, and an increase in speed with altitude. I'm, I don't think I've ever flown in shear wave or thermal wave when the wind speeds remain constant, but the direction has changed. Um, it's, it's always, there's been a small direction change and then, oh, we've lost that now. I don't know what I've done. Uh, but anyway, we, we basically got what we needed to, to get from that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to um, see you. So this is um, this is on the day. And I'm going to take this back. I'll put quite a few gliders on here just because the additional tracks show some interesting things. So essentially, this is if I play it now, this is off off uh, off launch climbing up. Um, you'll see down here on the bottom left corner, we've got a, a wind direction of 240 degrees at 20 knots, yeah, 37 kph, which is basically bang on 20 knots. Um, you can see, can see everyone else is also launching now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play through. Um, it takes, takes a while to get into the waves, so, and, and a number of thermals. And, the other thing I wanted to add is that you would have noticed I, I'm the, the red glider here. In this instance, I was the first glider off. Um, normally, normally I would um, I would take off last or or late, but in this instance, because I thought there's a chance of of um, thermal wave, and it's probably about at least 10 percent of days um, if I think back to all the gliding competitions we've had um, all the times I've flown in competitions it's I, I would say about 10 percent there's one out of 10 days there's always a chance of finding thermal wave um, and it's very weak but and it takes a long time to get into but it gives you a good start height advantage so hence I took off early to try and have as much time as possible. Um, so you can see where everyone's climbing up. And as I said, you have to, you really have to work quite hard to get into the thermal wave. You have to climb up to the top of uh, one thermal, push on to the next thermal, top of that thermal, push on to the next thermal, top of that thermal, push on to the next thermal, to try and suss out the conditions and, and to try and get as absolutely high as you can and I'm just trying to get to the to the key moment here where let me just go in a bit closer here. Just check um if, if you look at the altitude we're at um about nine thousand feet here. So we're very close with top of the inversion for the day. Uh, still climbing, and now we're going through 10. So basically now is when i just want to pause that this if you look along here this is basically the axis of the thermal so the streets were running 
with a southwesterly direction. Now, it's interesting that the forecast had a northwesterly wind, but we actually had southwesterly. So the forecast was a little bit off um, in the direction and the strength, but it still gave me a, a pretty darn good clue that we were going to get, or there was a good possibility of shear wave. Normally, uh, I don't know how to do that. I'm not uh, uh, this one, but I don't know how to do it um, concurrently. But um, you'll you'll see that we're drifting this way. Now, typically, the the thermal wave in South Africa, every other time that I've flown in thermal wave, the wind has been, the lower level wind has been from the northwest. Um, so the wind would be, say, blowing along the track line in this instance. And the wave has always been on the western side. So, or the left side as you drift down the, down the thermal. So you'll see on the, on the red glider here, just try and go in a bit closer here and I'll play this and you can see now I actually went to the to the left side that's this um, normally it would be on the western side but because the wind was so far to the southwest I actually went on to the southern side expecting that's where it would be and I got lucky and I think I think this was more luck than anything on this particular day that I found it. Um, the key being that I was super high and um, and I was the highest glider and I managed to 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 get into the into the thermal wave. So the, the key is every time in thermal wave. The key is you have to literally be at the inversion. So on a blue day, that means you you have to be the very highest you can possibly be. Or if there's clouds, you need to be literally in the bowel of the cloud. Um, if you try, you, you could see gliders climbing the thermal wave um, just on the side of the cloud. And literally, if you are not in the mist, when you push out, you you won't hit the wave. Um, it, it can literally be a matter of feet. And you'll see here, so let's just play. I'm actually going to slow this to 20 times. Now I'm on the red glider here. You can see the wind has now swung more to the west and it's now 80 kph. And you can see my turns. And you can see my turns are actually just above all the gliders below which are much lower than me which are still climbing in the thermal you'll see i'm ever so slightly upwind and every time i turn i fly into wind for a while and then turn again and then fly into wind again so we'll see here i've found it again you'll see i'll turn into wind into wind the upper wind a bit of an s turn but i find s turns don't work that well into wind again when you turn, you're kind of turning with about a 20 degree bank. And you can normally get two, three turns in, and then you have to kind of push back into wind. So in this instance, if you imagine the thermal beneath you, it's, I, I actually read a, a very old article now from about the 1980s and um, And it basically said that, or hypothesized that the thermal wave was essentially the ridge left in front of the thermals. I'm just gonna pause there, sorry. The, the ridge lift was in front of the thermals. But what I've found is the, the wave is actually the strongest. Um, if there's cumulus days, you'll get a very nice cumulus uh, embankment upwind of you. And the best wave can actually be behind that cumulus. 
um, where you'd expect good, good wave to be um, in a mountain environment. But you have to remember that the wave, the thermal, is, is set on top of the on top of the cloud street beneath or the, the thermal line. So let me just and the amount of the amount of wind change that you need to have is only about seven knots. I, I, don't, I don't know where I read it, but if you've got a proper seven knot perpendicular wind, um, and in this instance, if we go back, I think we had it's interesting that it's quite south there. Low down, it was like 254 degrees at 40, and up high, up high, it was 270 at 80. So there's a, only about a 10 or 15 degree. Um, wind shift with altitude, but it did increase a hell of a lot. Um, and if you work out, if you triangulate the, perpen the perpendicular, the proper cross crosswind of that um, of that wind that wind shift uh, in this day was only about nine knots, um, and the wave was was quite reasonable. It took us about four thousand feet above the inversion. Which is quite good. Normally, normally I find that only about thousand meters, uh, three thousand feet above the inversion, is the is your kind of lot. I'm gonna just show you here. Um, Right, this. So this picture I've got here, um, you can see the lower, lower wind is making the cloud streets. Um, typically the, the thermal wave we get in South Africa will be blue. And then the upper wind but as I say, the, the upper wind will be much stronger, but the, it won't be coming 100% perpendicular like in this example. It'll be coming from only about 15 degrees or so, um, but that's enough. If, if it's more than seven knots, then it works. Um, I have seen, I think there's been about two or three really special days that I've managed to fly on, but many, many years ago, where there was a good inversion, everything was right for the, for the thermal wave, but there was a good amount of humidity. Uh, cloud bases were quite low, maybe 8,000 feet. There was a good one, one and a half thousand foot of cumulus cloud, and it made, made a very visual uh, rotor wave bars. So you could actually clearly see what you had to do, but but as I say, normally from experience, it's it's blue days or very, very close to blue days um, when you get this uh, shear wave phenomenon. We'll go back to I just want to go back to see you. Um I just want to play a long track here a little bit. So on this day, the others didn't get quite as high as me. Um, you know, I launched early, managed to climb up in the, in the shear wave, thermal wave. And the very, the best you can get is about three meters, but, but normally it's about a meter at best. And normally when you do get into it, um, you really have to work in half a meter or so for many, many minutes to just gain those few, you, you literally inch up. But just once you get above the inversion, then the wave 
starts proper. And then, as I as I say, if it's really really good, if it's if it's classic, you'll get uh, about three meters. And um, but typically you're looking at one meter to two meter. So it's a really long, slow, drawn out climb. And your total climb for the whole thermal wave, because obviously it takes a hell of, hell of a long time to establish in it, it is probably in the vicinity of half a meter to a meter. So it's not something that you would typically use on a normal sort of cross country soaring day um, because it's, it's just too painful. Uh, but it's super interesting to do because it's something different, but it teaches you a lot about how to anticipate, especially in the, in, in the blue days, because a lot of you, when you fly on certain blue days, you'll say, just the, it was a, a, a funny day. Um, there were good thermals, but the sink was horrendous and nothing seemed to work as, it, as you expected. And those days, there's thermal wave. So what's happening, and don't ask me why, I haven't figured this out in my mind, but for whatever reason, the sink quite happily goes down well below the inversion into the lower atmosphere. So you can get large stretches of really, I need to be looking along this sort of direction. I don't do it, it helps a lot, and you anticipate these things. But, um, but yeah, once you, once you understand it, I mean, you get these killer days, these peculiar days that seem funny. It's, and it's all caused by the, oh, have we, is it working? Now, can you guys, uh, can you hear me still? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So Eskim's playing games again. Okay, cool. Um, back to where we were. Um, okay, then I forgot what we were discussing. Um, oh yeah, just when you're when you're low down, you've got one of those uh, those funny blue days. So if you kind of know or expecting shear wave, then it, then it starts to make sense again, and then you know, okay, you just need to go a little bit further into wind or or crosswind. Um, and you should hopefully get out of the down area. But as I say, even even for me, it it does seem that for whatever reason the air seems incredibly harsh when you're low down in the shear wave. So yeah, on on on, on thermal wave days, just the key is to try and stay high because if you get low, yeah, it's it's fun and games. But um, I just want to go back and show you on this particular day. So I was um, quite a lot higher than everyone else um, and they were ahead of me, which was quite handy. Um, this, is, this is when it really beca can become quite a clever tool because if you know there's thermal wave and you see gliders thermaling, thermaling ahead of you, you know that, okay, I just need to be ever so slightly on the windward side and I should get some wave. So let's just see here. I'm just on the red glider again here. I'm just gonna speed this up a little bit. 40 is probably good. Um, so you can see these gliders ahead here are climbing. So I can see them low down. Thinking, okay, that's interesting. Let me go. Oh, obviously got a bit of a push there. 
I think what I actually flew into here is I flew into, and I just wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause that and just go back. You will, you will see the drift here on these thermals. And then you'll see my drift above them once I get established. So you'll see here, and you can see these guys were also must have been in the wave because their, their lines were also much more around to the north. So now I can see the gliders ahead. Uh, here, just feel a, feel a push. So generally in the thermal wave, so knowing that the wind's coming from the west, if you if you fly into any sort of lift, and I think this is general for, for wave flying anywhere, even if, in, if you're in the mountains. When you fly into lift, you turn into wind. So you'll see here, and just a little sort of kind of a turn into wind, ah, it's no good. And then off I went again. So yeah, that's about it for the thermal wave. Um, I'm just gonna just let that. So, so yeah, it's one of those things that you just need to. You need to check the check the TFR grams. I mean, that's quite important. And if it looks like it's a possible day, really give it give it a lot of hard work. And and it can take you one two hours to to get into the to the thermal wave um, on your initial time. Now, once you've done that more regularly, then you'll start to pick up the little subtleties and so on. But but all you can do is climb up to. Ho hopefully, it's a, it's a day with clouds. That's probably probably the first time you'll achieve it is when there's clouds. Because on the in the blue, it can be a little bit more tricky, I think. But there's some clouds around, such as in the picture. You climb up to cloud base, and then you'll push into the upper wind. So you need to know which side of the cloud street is the upper wind coming from. Climb right up into the cloud, literally into the mist, then push out into the uh, into the upper wind. So in this case, it's coming on the left side of the clouds and then immediately start ridge sawing the clouds. And it, for many times you'll have zero, maybe, Point one, point two. Um, you just got to stay. If, if you're going up, then you stay with it. And for whatever reason, I I don't find S turning works that well um, because the thermal wave seems a lot more patchy. So you'll see back on my um, on my CU trace, I was turning. I, I literally never never S turned. So if you feel if you feel you you're kind of in a zone that's going up, just do a gentle turn, maybe 15, 20 degrees worth of bank, and you just aim into wind a little bit for five seconds or so, and then turn again and do that, and you'll you'll find you drift, and the, and the wave itself is not you know it's not fixed to the ground. Uh, there's there's no fixed feature that's forming the wave. The wave is the wave is fixed on the cloud streets and the cloud streets themselves are drifting. So you'll find that the, the thermal wave is getting pushed downwind the whole time. So um, you, know, you can actually climb up in a wave in, in a wave on a wave bar and you'll see that it drifts, but it drifts a lot slower than the, than the upper wind speed. It's drifting at the, or moving essentially at the lower wind speed. Um, I think the next thing we're gonna we're gonna talk about is um, 
just whether you must turn into wind or um, or downwind when you when you fly into uh, the thermal. So just want to see. Um, So in this image here, we've got a mountain range and some nice cumulus for me. It looks like it's sort of an early, late morning, early afternoon kind of day. So, um, so that, that, that's how it looks to me. But, but what I'm trying to say in the image is that these thermals, they are, they are hinged to a focal point on the mountain. So if you come back in about two hours time, those clouds will still be in the same location. Um, and this works for convergence, um, a power station, you know, any, anywhere where there's a, like a fixed source that's producing a thermal, you will find that the clouds are, are, are largely hinged. To, to that source. The clouds, the clouds and the thermals do drift. Um, they don't drift with the, um, with the, uh, with the, the upper wind speed. And, and actually that's a key point for the thermal wave is that when the thermal ascends through the air, it's basically, it, it's got a lot of mass and it's ascending as it ascends through the upper the upper winds, it's still ascending with whatever speed it had you know, in the lower atmosphere. And it takes a long time for that, um, for it to get accelerated by the upper, the upper winds. And those upper winds are, are getting pushed and deflected over it. So in this sort of case, I, I like to say that the thermals are, uh, are located on a fixed point for argument's sake. The, the next option is that, and this is very much flying in South Africa on the high felt, is that we have very few um, focal points for the thermals, as I say, unless there's a convergence or, or, the, or there's something like that, um, or there's a big, uh, a big felt fire. The, the thermals themselves, they pretty much drift with the wind speed, I find. Um, and if any of the um, cross country soaring uh, literature, um, it, all, it all seems to refer back to the thermals don't drift with the wind, but they definitely do in South Africa. So I think, I think this is a, a case that a lot of it is based in Europe and there's, there's more uh, surface friction. So you've got towns, forests. So the thermal itself doesn't, it, it, it's not very fluid on the ground. Whereas in South Africa, um, the terrain, you know, if you take the high felt, uh, and especially in springtime when the conditions are really good, uh, the crops uh, are non-existent. It's just brown fields as far as the eye can see. So there's very little surface friction. So the air can just rush across the ground um, as it feels. And I find as very much as the, the thermal, you know, the, the wind speed's 40 kph, that thermal is definitely going up at 40 kph, definitely drifting at 40 kph. Um, even from low down. And it kind of got me thinking that, you know, what's the correct way? Do you turn into wind or, you, or do you turn downwind when you, when you fly into lift? And um, again, all the, all the, the standard cross country books that, that have been written, um, I think they, they always kind of refer back to you should turn into wind. And that definitely seems to work. If you fly in New Zealand where it's just lots of big hills and mountains, 
uh, again, the thermals are, are pretty much hinged on a focal point. So you literally, when you feel some lift, the probability that the core is into wind is greater than it is downward. Whereas in South Africa, it's, it's vice versa. Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't have a very good prop to try straight how it works on a mountain, but let me try and do it this way. Okay, so I'm gonna take take let's take my this tender document. So this, if I turn this like this. I'll just shout out if you guys can't see that very clearly. Um, my coffee there, and this is this is a pretty crappy mountain, but this is this is a mountain, and the sun shining in here, and there's a there's a tiny breeze coming up here. So this is like a fantastic thermal source. So literally, you've got. And this is our thermal. We've got this thermal coming up, and this thermal is literally kind of going up like this. But there's lots of broken, disturbed air that also kind of filters away. So probability-wise, if you if you closed your eyes and you didn't know that you were aiming at exactly this point on the mountain. I mean, this could have, you could be you know, thousands of feet up. So, and there could be lots of these little, little um, uh, hillockies and things. So you're not sure, you, you don't know. You're flying along, you've got this thermal. The air here, like here, and this could be a five meter thermal. Here, the air is almost dead still. There's no disturbance here at all. But at the back of the thermal, you know, this thermal, the wind's coming this way, but this thermal's kind of hinged here. This is this is going up. And, and you can kind of also see this from felt fires. You can see the rubbish and the crap here. When if you if you take the law of averages, if if, if this is a, a corridor that you're going to fly through, forgetting there's a thermal here, and you fly through this corridor and you don't know where you you know, whether you're on this side or that side, you're just flying along the stretch that's 10 kilometers wide. But all there's, the, the air is all buoyant. When you come this way, and the wind is coming this way, remember, when you come this way, the probability that the thermal is into wind is almost 70%. Because unless you're on this side of the corridor, you're gonna, well, you're gonna fly straight into it. If you're just here, you're going to have to turn downwind. But in all the zone here, you have to turn into wind. And you could imagine this is repeated a million times across the landscape because there's lots of these tiny little hills, but all the thermals are hinged. That's, that's what I call the into wind effect. And that's pretty much what every book on cross country soaring talks about. But it doesn't, it doesn't work, it, it, it's a rule, but once you kind of understand the science behind the rule, rule, you understand that, okay, eventually the rule flicks in the complete opposite. And that's the case of South Africa. And again, it's only by flying in lots of different places that you start to put all the little pieces of the puzzle together and figure out, okay, when when the ground is rough and this, so you could say lots of hills or mountains makes very rough ground, the ground's very sticky. Um, it doesn't per permit the thermals to, to drift across the ground. The thermals are, are basically hinged to a, a specific point and they keep triggering from that point. So then you know you need to turn into wind. In the South African context, You've got, you know, you've got 
now ground that's that's very smooth it's getting superheated very good for thermals but it's very smooth so now you've got a thermal that forms and again this is our thermal but this thermal is basically and the, the wind's coming from this direction this thermal's drifting pretty much at the wind speed and this thermal is shown by a by a dust devil so when you see a dust devil drifting across a field like so you'll see that this being the downwind side there is very little disturbance on the ground on the downwind side on this side there's a lot of there's a bit of dust and there's fragments and there's disturbances and so on and if you fly through this area you will feel the air will will be buoyant you know, you'll feel you'll feel something there's something something's been happening so if you go by the remember the wind's coming this way so if you're going with the of all the the general literature for, for cross-country soaring you'll turn into wind away from the thermal source but in essence again and this is back to the law of averages of you know this this is sort of one segment and this this is gets repeated a million times across the free state when you enter this segment and all the air is buoyant in this area but the core is here the law of averages say that actually you should turn downwind because Here's the middle, and the wind's coming this way. So the law of averages says that seventy percent of the time the thermal is actually down on the on the downwind side. So that's that's kind of the turn into wind or away from wind rule. Um, and the last little thing, which is not really related to anything, but I did find it when I was um, just looking through stuff. Um, was was this, and it, it, it doesn't actually say anything on the on the picture, but but in the article that was, and it was for hang gliding, I think it was. Um, is that the cloud streets and i haven't really noticed it much in south africa but definitely in europe new zealand you have these cloud streets um and in this case the wind say this is an orderly wind uh this is a westerly sun so it's sort of late afternoon um, the sun shines in nicely underneath these cloud streets and and what you actually find is these cloud streets slowly grow to the west so they slowly keep coming and um i guess it must be a hundred percent due to a kind of a convergence effect that the sun the clouds make a shadow a cool zone you've got a warm zone and this cool zone keeps undercutting the this warm zone and it pushes the cloud streets so the cloud streets very slowly maybe like five or ten kph but the cloud streets are drifting down with the wind but they're also like slowly growing towards the sun um i have seen it in south africa but but it's it's kind of a regular thing when the cloud bases are a little bit lower it's it's something that you'll probably see in um in late summer, um, you know, autumn flying in South Africa when the air is a little bit more humid, um, you need to have kind of like four eights cumulus. It seems like three eights, four eights, something like that, and 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 this phenomenon seems to uh, take effect. But yeah, it's something else that can be uh, interesting and to uh, to look for. But yeah, that's it. I don't know if there's uh, any questions from anyone. That I can try and answer, but yeah, otherwise, hopefully, you, you learn something. And um, as I say, with the with the shear wave, it's 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 really quite tricky. 
takes a lot of a lot of time. Um, the key is to to find try and figure out to, the day is a good day and and maybe you can always you know send us a message or something like that if you think is it is it a possible day and you can say yes you know you can have a quick look and then if it's possible it, it could take you hours to get into it but once you actually get into it, it's quite rewarding um, mainly because it took so long to get into it but it it's really handy if you can get your head around it because um, you can then extrapolate that understanding to just general blue flying and, and general general gliding days um, when you can't explain a lot of funny things can actually be explained um, by thermal wave. Cool. Thank you.